Yeah, I'm so grateful that you took your time out to do this. I'm so grateful that you invited me, and I'm so grateful for your book. So I have to tell you something. This morning, I got a text from one of my oldest, very best friends in the world, and he said, please tell Sarah I said hi. His name is Obi. Oh my gosh, Obi! So, Wait, you? So, yes, I I know Obi I, since I'm 12. Now, now I know you and I just met through Tommy, who, Tom, who I love, and I joke that now he's like my publicist because he's amazing, and I want him to be my brother. But Obi and I, you'll see when you read my book, Obi and I kn- have known each other since we were. Uh, he's two years older. He's your age. So, since I was 12, and we. Well, my dad died. My mom, we left New Jersey and moved to Santa Monica. And we were in the Santa Monica Playhouse together. We were in plays together. And I've stayed friends with him all these years. Okay, I remember that part of your book. I remember when you okay, had, yes. had that first move. I'm on page 262. Oh. So I can speak about your life up until page 262 <laughs> when you're currently in, um, like in Lydia's workshop. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so but are you, are you up to date on OB or no? I uh, j- just recently got a little okay. bit of an update on Obi. Okay. How okay. is he doing? How is he He's doing? He's doing really well. So he did this really inspiring post this morning. So people watching our mutual friend Obi in August was putting groceries in his car at Air One, which is like his beloved health food store on Beverly Boulevard in Los Angeles. And a person under the influence drove into him as he was loading his groceries and his one of his legs was left at the scene and the other one was amputated at the hospital. So he's a bilateral amputee at, at 46 years old. And um, his, his recovery and his healing has been miraculous. So yeah, so he lost both his legs and within like eight weeks or something, he was doing yoga, he, you know, he was he was so strong mentally and physically that his recovery was just remarkable and he attributes so much of it to the way he eats he's like hardcore vegan raw anyway he did a um, gofundme and he got um you know really great prosthetics which he's now learning how to use which is really hard work but his spirit is he just did this whole post this morning about like crying and gratitude and he's been just so honest about his journey i had him on the insta live Oh, you did? Yeah. So anyway, so I did not sorry know. I missed that. No, you didn't. We didn't know each other. I didn't. Okay. Um, I had. I'm so excited to know. Yes, yeah, so you guys were at Yale together. We were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but before, but we met before that. I mean, we met. So it was the summer of 1993. We were at Williamstown Theater Festival in the Act One company. So this like small wow. group, and I met Obi there, and then. And then I, that's the summer that I went, that's the fall that I went to drama school. And then he came a year later. He was a year behind me. Oh my gosh. And, um, oh my God, that's just amazing. And I have been, I have been woefully out of touch. Well, Um, so when we hang up, I'll do a group, I'll do a group text. And he would, I'm sure he, he's probably watching now. He was like so excited. He was like, hi, hi. Yeah, he's been, um. he's been, he's just an incredible, incredible person. Magical being. He's so vulnerable. He's so present, you know, and, and since you've known him, you know, he became a yogi and a yoga teacher. And so he's just so deeply connected and present, you know, it's incredible. So, um, yeah, so many fans on here are just complimenting Donna. You, um, I mean, let's talk about that. That's, that's gotta be incredible. But how long, nine years? Oh yeah. Nine years, nine years, nine years. Wow. Yeah. Like that. That's just, and and it's like, you know, I mean, there's there's a few shows, obviously, that have that kind of run, but that's not, that that's remarkable. Yes, and it went by so fast, and it was... Yeah, it, it was, it was an amazing, it was an amazing time. I mean, I, it, we just finished in September and moved back from Canada. It was also magical because we were in Toronto and I was having my kids at the, you know, I was raising, my kids were really little. One of my second child was born um, between seasons one and two. Like I went wow. back to work five weeks or something after, wow. she was, you know, like really, wow. really spanked up. 
after she was born. <laughs> like, um, Toronto, I haven't been. Oh, no, I did. I went once when I was like 18. But one of my really good friends, and I wonder if you know her because she's an actress and a singer. Her name's Amy Jo Johnson, and she's based in Toronto. I don't um, know. She had, she was on a show for a long time called Flashpoint that was filmed okay. there. But back in the day, she was on Felicity. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. But, um, but she lives there. And I have a bunch of friends that live in Toronto and just say it's just a magical place. It's it's definitely one of my favorite places in the world. It was really, that was, a, you know, at first you get a job, you hope it gets picked up. You know, I mean, I don't know how many pilots I did before that. And the, the interesting thing about that was... So that summer that I met Obi at Williamstown Theater Festival when we were in that little company in 1993, I also met Gabriel Moft, who was the star. Yeah, the stars of that's wild. And so years later, he's the one who gave me the script. I had just done a pilot. That pilot didn't get picked up. He, I saw him at a premiere of one of the movies that he was in with his wife. I, they, he had like just walked the red carpet. I was hanging out with his parents. Oh my God. And um, he just like read me. He so you like, were 20, 1993, you were like 20? 19, yeah. Yeah. I was, I graduated. 21, school, 21. That's how I knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, that's to, like... what I love about your book because every time you make a music reference, I'm like <laughs> completely there. Like there in that moment. So I mean, did I know you, I'm older than you. But did you graduate what, in 91 or 92? I graduated college in 93. Okay. And then okay. Drums, Okay, so you, because I was 18 when I graduated high school. You were probably 17 then. Yeah, I was 89, okay. 17. Okay. I, um, Isn't that just it's weird? It's all out there now. Wait, I have to tell you something. So okay. I, I just woke up from, not just woke up, but I slept in. I woke up from a dream. It was so bizarre. I went back to high school. And also my friend Holt McCallany was in it, who's an actor. I just texted him. He's like, that sounds really funny. But I... I dreamt that we at RAs went back to high school and I hated it so much and it was so hard and I was so bad at it and I woke up and but I have these recurring dreams about school but it was like in my body now back and deciding to go back in high school and it just it made me think like god I wouldn't want it to be 1993 again for anything oh, I mean oh I'm in <laughs> we can I just say this I have that dream I have that dream. I have a recurring dream of going back. It's either high school or it's college because for me, I went to boarding school. So I lived in a dorm in high school. Oh, that's hard. Okay. And sort of had that college-ish. Yeah. It, I mean, it was eight, It was the eight. So it was like pay phones, the dorm, yeah, all that. Yeah. But I have that dream that I'm going back and there's always like a mix of people in, wait, I'm trying to move my, um, there's always a mix of people from various stages in my life. And I can't, it's like, I can't find my dorm. Oh my and God. I have all that awkwardness. Mine's my locker. I can never remember my locker combination and it's recurring. Okay, so. It's like an anxiety dream. This is the thing. Are there any therapists on here who can comment <laughs> on what this dream means or any type of oh my God. people? Because I love, people are like, I was born in 93. I know some, I have like I'm, my friends that are born in 96. And I'm like, oh my God. I, I, I'm afraid. Of, yeah. So, so wait, the other recurring dream is, and I thought, again, I thought I was unique with this recurring dream until I was sitting with my friend Christine at dinner like two years ago. And I was like, it's kind of like this. And I thought I was about to like, really sh share, like I braced myself to be like, I'm this weirdo and I have this dream and I have it all the time. And I was like, it's this dream where I'm in a house and she's like, and you open a door and there's a whole other aspect of the house that you've never accessed before, but it's the house you live in and it's the magical part of the house. And I was like, yeah, and it's like, it's like the attic with the light streaming. I'm getting chills right now. The hair, my hair is standing up on it. And I was like, and it's the most beautiful. She's like, w all women have that recurring dream. And I was like, that piece of us that we don't, that we have this sense that we're not accessing, the door that we're not opening that to that magical piece. The house is us. I love it. I love it. And I love it. Do you know this dream? Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. You, uh, the hair on my, I'm standing, I'm like yes. uh, sweating. Yes. I'm having some sweat. What is oh that? I mean, you must know. You must know. Well, I'm just thinking, you know, God, I've been having such deep, deep dreams lately. Um, I mean, I think it's exactly what you said. All these parts of us that are, are, untapped resources you know these like parts of us that are like okay there's a poem that i love by stanley kunitz he's passed away beloved um jewish american poet 
And I remember when I was at NYU, before I dropped out, um, I went to his 90th birthday party, or 92nd birthday party. And it was at a church at NYU. And all these famous poets were, keep in touch with me, will you watch? And then it'll be really meta, because you're gonna watch this interview on my Instagram and be like, I was sitting right over there. <laughs> Send me a message. And I'll follow you back on Instagram. Okay. What's your name? Michelle. Michelle. Okay. Um, so don't worry. I've been watching. Don't give me shit. She was like 50 feet away from me. Um, Is she a neighbor or are you in a park? No, I came away. Um, I live in a 500 square foot apartment and I was losing my fucking mind. I have a four year, almost four year old. So I came to Ojai where I was actually meant to be leading a retreat this weekend for Mother's Day. I lead a Mother's Day retreat. That's not necessarily, you don't have to be a mother. You can love your mother. You could hate your mother. You could be a mother. You can have lost a child. It just falls on mother and it's about honoring the mother or, you know, delving into that. And obviously we canceled it. And, um, and I just, I've been really working really hard on this project. Sometimes yesterday or the day before I did six interviews. And I was like, I got to get out of this apartment. No air circulation, one bedroom, three of us. Um, so I, so I took my family here. So I'm in Ojai. That's so great. And there's a magical vortex there. That Thank you. So I was talking yesterday to this amazing writer and actress named Tembi Locke. And she spent a lot of time in Italy. And I was saying my two places are Ojai and Italy where I feel that, but specifically in Ojai, there is a vortex. And you, anyone can Google it and find out more about what that means. And like Sedona, I've never been there, but it's the same kind of thing. That's on my list to go feel that. And there, and and I remember when I was in high school, I went to Santa Fe with my family, and I felt, I felt something when I went into those um, oh those caves that have the cave writing on them. Um, I just felt, I just walked into this area, and I was like, wow, I can feel in my Isn't body. That amazing? That there's okay, so, so someone's getting mad poet. at me. Poet. The poem. I'm going to get back to the poem, but okay. someone's like, you didn't let her finish the story about how, how um, Gabriel got you the part. So I want you to finish that story. Oh my gosh, you can actually, I can't, I literally, I can't. Don't worry. Don't mm. even worry. Yeah. What if I spend the entire time like this? I hope like, you will. You should like do my it. mom. Like yeah, my mom. I mean, I, how are your eyelashes so amazing in the quarantine? I put on mascara for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I get extensions, and so uh -huh. I have, like, one. Okay, so tell that yeah. story so your No, I totally don't... put on mascara for you. Um, but I'm getting to the point where I really need glasses, so I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to have Me to. Me too. Me too. But I can see. Um, so when people have really impassioned fans like you, Pink, ooh, that conversation, I swear some of her fans wanted to kill me because oh, the live, I'll tell you why, the live didn't work. So I had a FaceTimer and then record it with my husband's phone. And so I wasn't, I was focused on her. So I guess I was like moving the phone around and they were, they were livid. Like, hold the phone steady. Let's all be grateful right now for know, every piece of these connectable moments that we get to have and let's cherish them. I, mean, I know I felt really bad. I was like, oh my God, I felt horrible. You should see people, the things they were saying to me, like you're the worst camera person ever. Like, well, thank God that's not my career. Oh um, my gosh. Know, oh my gosh. So, oh my God. But, okay. Tell the story and then I'll share about the poem. Yeah. So, so real quick. No, I think I did. I think I did tell that whole story just now, which was that well, you I met him, you met him in 93 and then, and then you, you were saying about something like he brought you the script. No. Oh, yeah. So, so, okay. So we met in 93. We stayed really, really good friends. I mean, I, after that, I went to drama school. He came to see the plays. He still was in college at Carnegie Mellon. Um, we, we just like, he introduced me to all his friends, vice versa. We hung out in New York. Um, the first time I came to, I mean, the first time I came to California to do a play at the Old Globe, that was the first time oh, yeah. I'd ever been to California. I think it was like 99, 98 Is that 99. San Diego? No, where is yeah, that? Yeah, yes. Okay. And so um, I remember like he showed me around LA, all this stuff. So anyway, I mean, it's like his parents were like my emergency contact basically when I moved out here. So <clears throat> cut to years and years later, I had, so I was at his premiere with Jacinda 
and hanging out with him, but he just read me really quickly and was like, what's going on? And I was like, nothing, no, you know, nothing. I mean, I literally, right before I left, hung up the phone to hear that this pilot, it did, didn't get picked up. And he was like, come on, what's, what's going on? And I was like, this pilot, that pilot, it didn't get picked up. And he was like, oh, great, great. Um, I have a script. I just literally a day ago signed on to do this show called Illegal Mind. There's this part in there, Donna, promise me you'll read it and get an audition. Please, 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 just promise me you'll get an audition. Wait, you just called yourself Donna. I did? You said, Donna, promise me you'll read it. Oh, did I? Oh my, I think. Sounded like I? it to me. What? It sounded like you said, Donna, promise me you'll read it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna argue, I'm not arguing. Okay, I'm okay, okay. It comes out. <laughs> So, so, um, so I read it and, uh, I couldn't get an audition for it out here because it was shooting in New York where I had just, where I had just moved away from. And so I put myself on tape and sent it to the casting director. In I love it. I love it. And then it, it became, and then this, and what was interesting was when it got picked up, I think we were all like, oh, we thought it was going to shoot in New York. You know, I'm, I'm from Connecticut originally. I lived in New York for 12 years with my husband. Like, um, that's right where I moved, you know, I moved there in 96. That was home. So I thought I was just gonna move with my baby back home. Wait, and I have to moving. tell you, every, yeah. there's like 500 comments now that are like, she did call herself Donna. So I did? did? Yeah. That's, yeah. You yeah. heard it here first, friends. She really, everyone's like, she did, ha ha, she's that good. Yesterday when I, I was had Chrissy Metz, who I worship, bow down at yes. the altar of, I was like, Kate, I called her Kate, and I was like, oh my God. Okay, so go on. So, so, so you guys thought it was going to film in New York. And then it filmed in Toronto, and that was like, that was very scary. That I'm was sure. super, super scary. I'm and then sure. it turned out to be one of the greatest gifts. Oh, I have the chills. I mean, it was the friends that I had from there. It'll always be one of those magical places. I mean, it's definitely, you, you say in your book that there are many homes, like you can feel at home in places that you don't live, like Italy, when you showed up there. Didn't you say oh, you hi. felt like- Oh, hi, yeah, oh, hi, and, and, yeah. And you, so it's one of the, it will always be one of those places. Oh, I love that. Do you guys still have a house there or an apartment no. or anything? Okay. No, no. Oh, what a magical story. Okay, so, so back to- So the poet. What? Your poet. I know, I'm, I'm okay. circling back. So, so um, oh, I'm such a fan of it. I can't read it right now because I'm, I'm, um, I don't know how to do it while I'm on the phone, but, so I went to this birthday party. I, you know, I started as a poet, you're reading my book, and I, all these famous poets were there to honor him for, I believe it was his 92nd birthday. And they were, it was funny, they'd have his poems and they were reciting them, but they all knew them by heart. It was so emotional. So there was a poem he wrote, I wanna say it was on his 90th birthday and it's called The Layers. And he wrote it for his wife, I believe. He's passed away now, but I don't know the whole poem by heart or I do and I don't trust myself, but, um, one of, I'll tell you why I brought it up because of the of the dream with the doors. But anyway, the one line in the poem he says, "In my darkest night, in my darkest night, the moon, wait, uh, a nimbus clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt my book of transformations is already written, I am not done with my changes. And that last line, I am not done with my changes. And he wrote that in his 90s. And it always makes me cry. And there's another line in it where he said, how shall the heart be reconciled to its feast of losses? And I always think, well, it never gets reconciled. But I am not done with my changes. And he wrote that in his 90s. And I often read that in my workshops. And I, and I want to remind people that all the time, I am not done with my changes. So that, that dream, it's... it's that, it's that poem. It's like opening the doors. I am not done with my changes. So as many times as we might think like, well, this is it. It's not. Oh my gosh. I, yeah, that... you can, uh, I'll post, you know what, after, after um, this will share to IGTV, which is a new update I love, and I'll post the poem. And um, it's such, a, it's such, poetry is my, son of, I sound like Ziggy Marley, love is my religion. Poetry is my religion. <laughs> That's how I, I mean, feel when I read Mary Oliver. I yes. feel like it's church. 
You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes into the prairies and the deep trees. Meanwhile, now I can't remember the end. Anyway, <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, yeah, Mary Oliver. It's like amazing, church. amazing. Like church, you know? or I mean, I'm a Jew. It's like it's like synagogue church. Right. My friend, right. call, my friend's like, Jen, you're like a Jewish Baptist preacher, uh, <laughs> coach. I'll take it. Um, Those are all good things. Oh my so, god, all amazing things. So those of you, I know, I know there's a ton of um, Donna fans on here. And those of you, the reason, besides the fact that Matt, Donna and I are now soul sisters, that, <laughs> that Sarah is on here is because I have been um, working with Dana Mondello and a bunch of volunteers to, through On Being Human 2020, the name of this fund, to get people $100 gift cards for groceries. And it's a lot of work and it's daunting and it's beautiful and we need more donations. So if you have anything, the link is in my bio or on being human 2020. And if you don't, you can just spread the word. Maybe to, can you tell the origin story of that moment that you put it on your Instagram yeah. and asked a question and then how, and then how you're actually, how you're actually doing it. Like, yeah, like direct, yeah. the direct giving aspect of it. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I would love if everyone would follow my friend, my beloved friend, Simone Gordon on Instagram. She's the black fairy godmother. I've been working with her for quite some time. She's like my, she calls me like her Jewish auntie, but um, she does direct giving, you know, she was living in poverty. She, she was just like there in the trenches. And yet she started, she got the nickname, the black fairy godmother, because she started seeing people who needed help and finding ways to help them from her, from putting the word out. And so like, for example, she'd put the word out and we'd all send someone diapers or medicine or, or, or whatever it is, um, and raising funds and it's direct giving bypassing, um, you know, a big charity. And it's like someone saying, I need help. And another person going, here's the help. So I learned that from her. So I, through the years have created this platform online, but also in real life of real, my book's called on being human of like, of humanity and of just people bearing witness to each other and listening. And my tattoo says, I got you and, and just really embodying that. So about when the pandemic first started, I was doing some posts, like asking people, honestly, you know, how they were feeling. And then I did a post that said, do you have enough food to eat? I made a meme. And then in the caption, I said, this is a literal question. And I said, you know, I, I understand there might be some shame surrounding this and it might be hard, but if you don't tell us, we won't know. And the reason that I did that was not because I'm a millionaire, because I'm not, and I thought I could like feed everyone, but because I knew this community that I've been cultivating for years, I knew exactly what would happen, which is what did, is that someone would say, actually, no, I don't have enough food to eat. Actually, no, I don't have diapers for my two-year-old, my one-year-old. And the other people would jump in and help. And that's exactly what happened. And so like people were sending me money. I was then mowing and other followers were like sending money here and and one of my followers named Dana Mondello sent me a, a direct message after she sent someone $300 in groceries. And she said, do you want me to start you a GoFundMe? Would that be easier? And I just said, okay. So I did one of my uh, workshop on Instagram and about 12 grand came in from that. And I thought, how can I get creative and keep money coming into that GoFundMe? So I started doing these chats and then they exploded. Like, you know, for example, I met you through Tom and like he, you know, each time I did one, someone's like, this is great. Let me introduce you to my friend. And, um, and then also the Dork It Out Dance Challenge, which is just a silly little video you do and you challenge three friends. And it's a way to cultivate joy and freedom and um, more money. So when I have celebrities come on, it's really great because they have a ton of fans. And so it's just more people knowing about, about the funds. Um, and now a, a friend of mine of 25 years, this amazing human named Chris, she has a nonprofit called Credit Do. And so she's, we're working out the contract. She's partnering with us. So now we'll have that status and that will change everything. And it's right. been, a, it's just been a ton of work and beautiful and hard, like all things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it might seem easy to someone like, why, why is it taking so long? But when you're trying to get out.
1200 gift cards. That's what we're working on right now. To people across the country, it's not easy. <laughs> and, and you have to be very um, diligent with books because otherwise, you, you know, my, my partner, it, all the money's in her bank account. She's going to get in trouble for it unless, you know, we have to keep really good records of like, this is where it's going. And so the thing is, we capped it at 1200 but if we get more money in the GoFundMe, we're going to open up applications and, and have more people help. But we just need more money in the GoFundMe. Right now, I think there's 124000 in there. So... 124,000. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I put as, as a goal 250,000 and I just, I put that, I had no um, attachment. I just, I thought with all these celebrities I've on with all these people and especially with the nonprofit status, it, I don't see why not. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to do this because um I have to figure out like my own income for my family. My income, I have no income right now because all my stuff is my public speaking gigs, my workshops, my retreats all canceled. So I have to focus on that and also writing my next book and some other stuff. And, um, and so wherever we end up, it's going to be perfect. However many people we end up helping, it will be, it'll be what it'll be, you know? Right. Right. And it, it can take on a life of its own. You can give it its wings and let it fly like a child. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's just been on so many levels. It's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Um, other really rewarding things are, you know, I give scholarships to my retreats for a woman who's lost a child. And that's like um, working with young girls, like teen girls, um, for my girl power, you are enough. Now I call it G power, just to be more inclusive. Um, uh -huh. and, and then the work I do with Elizabeth Gilbert, these um, free workshops for women who work for nonprofits or spend their lives giving. Wow. And then wow. the work, I, the work I do with Lydia Yuknovich. So there's like four or five things that are, that are just like so near and dear to my heart that have nothing to do with money or anything. And this, this has been so expansive and even just the conversations and the people I've met, it's been, it's been, I don't know. It brings me to tears. It really does. I've, I've had the most, heart my conversations and met the most beautiful people for this cause, you know? Mm -hmm. Is the girl, the, the G power one, was that, is the kind of origin story of that, the, the purple notebook? Yes. And I love that you remember that. So, um, well, the origin story of that is I've been wanting to for a while. I've been leading these retreats and workshops and I was like, I really want to work with young girls. And I was with my friend, Laura Hyman, in her kitchen. And at the time, her daughter was 14. And she was, like, making a sandwich. She was like, you should. And I go, what should we call it? And they were doing yoga called Girl Power. And I thought, but there needs to be a subtitle. And the through line I saw in all my stuff, no matter where, what city, what age, was I am not enough of, of women saying I am not enough. And so I added, you are enough. And, and so Laura and I co-led it and it was like, we did one in Princeton and one in New York and there's an Instagram for it, but the, in, in life, the real life work. Shops were, oh, if I could spend my life working with young people, I would. And so we did one that was like, you, you know, any age and then one 16 and up. It's interesting. The 16 and up one was a bit easier because the younger girls were a lot more self-conscious. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, um, but it was magical. I just, I, I couldn't figure out a way to sustain it because it's, you know, in order to do it and make money, either the parents have to pay or someone has to sponsor. So I still want to get back to doing that. I just have to figure out how to do it, you know? Right. Um, right. So one of my goals, and it, and it really started to happen, was like to make more money so that I could do more free stuff and do. And so that's why the the workshop I was doing with Liz was so remarkable. You know, the more so I have this great speaking agent, I get paid all this money. I just signed with her, and then unfortunately everything got canceled. So, but the point is, the more money I can make, the more I can do things like for the young girls and not charge, or for people who work for nonprofits, or whatever it is, you know, for first line, uh, respond, first responders, you know? Right. Right. But we have to fill our own cup first. I can't do that if I can't feed my own family. <laughs> right. Right. right.
Right. Like Tommy was saying about the mask, put your, your own yes. oxygen mask on first. You have to do that um, in order to do it. But it's interesting. It's a really interesting time right now with, I mean, pre-pandemic is, is mostly what I'm referring to, but certainly now so many of these big brands are so socially conscious. Like, I mean, Dove has been forever thinking about um, supporting women and young girls in terms of the bo body image. And, um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of brands who may step in as sponsors to these kinds of events. Yeah, which... absolutely. But the thing is, you, you do need, um, I mean, as far as I know, you need that nonprofit status. So in the, so until like yesterday, right. basically, we're just a GoFundMe. Once we have a nonprofit status, people, a lot of people want to donate big chunks, but they want it to be tax deductible. Right, of course. Which of course. Are, yeah, and, and companies yeah. and what have you. Okay, someone keeps asking, what is written on the wall behind you? Okay, this is so nerdy. I love nerds and weirdos. Um, okay, so it is um, the Princess of France. Actually, this is sort of fitting. It's the Princess of France final speech in Love's Labor is Lost to the King of Navarre or whatever his name was, um, right after she gets the news that her father died. And um, it's... So it's a beautiful moment of making a pledge. It's kind of making a vow about how in, in 12 months after I go mourn my father and become queen and all, all these things, if we get through these hard times, then like come challenge me, challenge me by these desserts and by this virgin palm now kissing thine, I will be thine. But she's saying, she, tell, she sends him off to prove himself. And it's um, just, the, it's kind of a moment where she really finds her voice. Oh God, I love that. And I did the play, I've actually did the play twice. I did it once in college and I did it once in drama school. And it's funny, um, this piece was, uh, when I did it in drama school, and it's funny, the gentleman who directed it, it was his birthday yesterday. So just this week, I just tacked that up just temporarily my the, the whole set was these moving uh can like huge canvases with different speeches written on them but you couldn't see that from the audience right we just knew that words were there mm -hmm. and they moved in beautiful ways and then when the set was struck for some reason oh i think my pa my family was at the final performance and the set was being struck and so people were just like cutting them down off the wooden is that them, like from the Thanks. set, from the actual set? The, so this is from that set in 1996 or whenever, no, 1995. That's and my amazing. dad, my dad, I was like hanging out with my sisters and my family. My dad went over to one of the kids who was striking the set and was like, can you actually, can you just, can, can you cut it, like not cut it small, cut it big and give it to me? And so um, a few years ago, I was my parents were getting ready. To, my parents lived in Connecticut and New Canaan. Um, and they were getting ready to move to an assisted living in Stanford. And so my, we were in Toronto and my mom was like, it's time to come home and clear your stuff out of the basement. And so I got somebody to watch the kids and I thought my husband was going to stay in Toronto. But I, I said to him, I was like, this is kind of like that room, but in a different yes, way. Yes, yes. Um, I need to go into mom and dad's basement. And he had a lot of stuff there too. I mean, I met my husband in 94, he's just out of college. So he was like, I still have my stuff from college in your parents' basement. Like, <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in your parents' basement. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, it's gonna be emotional, like opening up this time capsule. So, and finding stuff. And I wanna share that with you. And so we went for, for two days and we're in that basement sort of curating our memories and, and helping my parents move stuff heavier stuff out and tagging things like you should sell this you should donate this that kind of stuff and um i found it like rolled up in a corner oh my God. and so actually just a few days ago i just said to my husband i was like can we just put this up temporarily i think it needs like a frame and it's funny so many people stuff. have been asking about it it's interesting it's 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 really funny also on that trip i feel like 
you might like this. I, I was going through like, I was going through some boxes from high school. Wow. I mean, the fact that I still have, I know it's like, pa it's like, no, no, that's episode me. Of I'm, I'm, orders. A, I'm a yeah. pack rat. No. Yeah, for sure. But it was amazing because we all wrote letters back then. And, and then like my husband went into the army when we were dating and I have a box of letters from him kind of before you didn't write letters anymore. But I found in my, in this box from high school, like I have ever, I had everything pretty well organized. Like here's a box from high school memory things I remember. Here's, I had every one of my college rejections. Oh my God. And I was like, holy cow. And I had all these garbage bags that I was filling and I threw them in the garbage bag and I went and it's like talking to my husband about it. And, and then I went back downstairs and was like, you know what? This is part of my story. So wait, so Yale, you didn't do Yale undergrad. You just, you did no, Yale No, Obi did. Obi did. No, I know. I know. He did both. He did undergrad he and did drama both. school. I went to Hamilton College in upstate New York. A okay. little liberal arts school. It was awesome. Loved it. It was great. Um, a wonderful school. So, <clears throat> and, but I had, when I was in high school, you know, I had applied to a lot of colleges. And so I got a lot yeah. of rejections. <laughs> a lot of rejections. And it was devastating. It was hard at the time. But when I was cleaning out the basement, I went back into the garbage and grabbed them because I just thought one day, if my kids go through a hard time, I can just show them my stack. <laughs> not, not necessarily it'll be related to them not getting into college or whatever thing they do, no. but, but just, I know oh, what this Sarah, feels like when I get through that's it. That's so beautiful and important. And you know, I mean, you're reading my book, so you understand how much I understand that. It's so, um, like things that are so painful and hard and even like all my years at the newsroom, um, at the restaurant I worked at, like I look, I get like, oh God, I was so stuck. Why, why did I stay so long? Why was I, but then I think I really do. I really do go, God, but that all led me here. And I know that sounds Pollyanna sometimes, but there's such a deep gratitude for, for the things that um, we've gone through and that even caused us heartbreak. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Somebody yeah. was asking um, if you've kept anything from this set of suits. Oh yeah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, there was really it was there was pretty stuff. I'm currently sitting on a couch that was Donna's couch in her. Apartment. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and then I have this little plaque that was also Shakespeare. It, it was um, I, we had the best set deck, set design, best wardrobe, like so thoughtful and so cool and chic and amazing. But I had that somebody just plopped. I don't know who it was. I don't know who did it. But they had a plaque on my desk because Donna started as a secretary. And it says, the first thing we do is we kill all the lawyers, Shakespeare. And it was just brilliant. They just plopped like there it was. And I, I, I didn't actually leave with it because they were going to, I remember at the end when things were getting kind of documented, I went and looked at my desk and I fully planned on stealing it. And I, I was like, where's Donna's plaque? And I looked at the gentleman <laughs> from set deck and he was like, I was told to, uh, I was like, they knew I was going to steal it. Like it was $4. Oh you know God, that's hilarious. They knew I was going to steal it. And, that's um, so and so funny. I just mentioned something to the producers. And the next thing I know, like a few weeks later, I, it was. Wait, also, it's just, I have to tell you, this is cracking me up. A few people have been like, please do another season of suits as if it's her call. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Okay. Let me get right on that. Um, there's nine seasons you guys can go back and watch. <laughs> go back and watch. So how, how are you doing with the, um, this time of social, how old are your kids now? My kids are eight and 12. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. My son's almost four. It's rough. I mean, at least eight and 12, they're more, um, oh, yeah. you I know, couldn't independent. I, the toddlers, the, ba the little babies and the toddlers, like all those I have been thinking about that so much, how hard this would be right now, too. I just have um, to... Okay, and then someone's saying, can you do a Donna spinoff? <laughs> write it for me! Yeah, write it for her. Um, so, yeah, 8 and 12. So how are you guys managing and, and coping and thriving and surviving and all that? Well, this goes back to your book. I think one of the things that I'm noticing is, like, the idea of being super 
super present. And you talk about that with baby Ronan, right? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Baby? Ronan, Ronan, yeah. Yeah. The Ronan. one who passed away. Yeah. And just that you list all the things you learned from him. And one of them is this. Is this. Presence. Which I think is always our challenge in life. Like the, talk about never being done. Like. Yeah. Never going to be done with trying to be present. So I found I have. Heard- found that if I'm not present I'm I'm really worried I'm like incredibly worried at this time and thinking of getting over one with everything if I don't stay in the present so the kids keep me there because yeah. they are very present um and so I think it's been a gift for me that Right now, I want to try as hard as I can to just do one thing, whether I literally mean that, like, just do one nice thing during the day, you know, play, play with that child, read to this one, have a conversation about this, go for a walk, find a way to be super present to each of them, but also to just, like, try to just be a mom right now, try to just not multitask so much and just make lunch. And just make lunch. I just want to make lunch sometimes. Just make lunch. No, but I so get it. That's why I actually, like, today this is the only one and I was so excited by that I was like I'm gonna be fully present and then tomorrow nothing and I mean that's one of the reasons I came here um to be more present it's were, uh, you, in, were you in New York after 9-11 not living Mm-mm. no okay so we were in New York and I feel like I think for everybody who lived through it wherever it was a really defining moment and I remember so my husband was he was at 30 Rock um, he had worked at Seven World Trade, and then he moved to working at Your 30 Rock. Your husband was on 30 Rock? He was on 30 Rock! <laughs> oh my god, that would be so cool. That Think of who I'd be friends with if my oh husband... Oh my god, you'd be best was... friends with Tina Fey and Alec Baldwin, and um, you'd just, yeah, you'd be so much cooler. Oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> um, so I remember the moment he was, he saw the second plane go in from a conference room, and then started walking home. We lived on the Upper West Side at the time. And I remember like, you know, we were all glued to our TVs seeing what was going on. And I remember I went to make the bed and like that moment of like taking the sheet and like putting it over the bed. I can literally remember how it sounded, how I felt, like the grief, the loss, the sense of like all the loss that was going on around me because, you know, these, those, we lived in a little building without a doorman, but we were surrounded by those pre-war doorman buildings yeah. on the Upper West yeah. Side, like the Dakota and stuff. And all those doormen were standing out front, like waiting to see if their residents would walk home, you know? And, uh. and just that feeling, that like hyper, that feeling of like, oh my gosh, this being able to make my, it sounds so dumb, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but like being able to make my bed, like, was the the blessing you know we have so I many blessings I don't think, right now gosh i don't think that sounds dumb at all I wonder, and i think i what think was it's really so hard. profound and so um so accurate right it's in the it's in the mundane and the it's in the mundane the the, the most beautiful things right beauty hunting <laughs> well and i think in the mundane is where the sublime is absolutely like, so yeah that, i don't think that sounds I mean, I like, think that is just so poetic and moving that, and the image of the, um, the sheet, you know, I mean, just stunning. Um, and I think what was, what was interesting because I, like, I went off and trained to be an actor and then I was in New York at that time and Santu and I, afterwards, you know, everybody was going down to the armory to try to like sign up. There were a bunch of, there were thousands of people and social workers down there with the clipboards taking names and phone numbers on paper of people to volunteer Mm -hmm. and they would ask you know what kind of skills you had and I remember waiting in this line and then the social worker got to me and I was like desperate to serve right like can it can I do something you were saying like how can I serve how can I serve that Wayne Dyer moment that happened to you and and I 
I remember it was so heartbreaking to me because it was like, okay, are you trained in first aid? No. Are you trained as an e e EMT? N no. Um, how many languages do you speak? You know, like all these things that I was like, oh. I, I was so lost in how could I serve? I mean, and so what we did was what a lot of people did was just went around to the fire stations and like waited with the, the firemen who were waiting and just, just, we just were with them. We just came together and just were just together. And that's what they needed. I mean, of course, of course, yes. That's not to say like they didn't need the first aid and, and you know, people with multi uh, languages, but that's what people need. They need, they need someone to bear witness. They need someone to go, I'm here. I got you. I see you. So I remember I was on Lincoln, like I was across from Lincoln Center, sort of in the 60s, like kind of down, down there and there was a firehouse and, and, and a fire engine came back and it was all covered with the white soot and a gentleman who was the captain stepped out. And I, w I would say he was like 62 or three, strong, super fit, but wise looking, you know, and, uh, I was just one of the three or four people, strangers kind of lingering, just being with the gentlemen that were there. And um, he stepped off, I remember he stepped off the truck and, you know, maybe he was 15 feet away from me and he walked by and he, he was staying like five feet and walking into this thing. And I just looked into his firehouse and I just looked at him and was like, I'm so sorry. And he literally came over to me and like collapsed in my arms. And did you just start sobbing? I, I think I just, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't even remember. I can't even remember really. I just, obviously I've held on to it, you know, like that was <laughs> something I've never, I've never, this, this has never come up like in conversation really that much. So it's funny that it's coming up now with you, like what you're drawing out, <laughs> you know, like, you know, but that, so there's something about this time with what, you know, what can I do? And you're doing that. Like, what can I do? And we have this amazing tool of social media that you have harnessed to, from your social distance to reach out and give people hundred dollar gift cards. Like, what can I do? You, you're literally, you're okay. literally handing people those gifts from. I love God. that you said, like, I really, recognize when you said like you went to the armory to volunteer and you're they were like do you know first aid do you know languages because that's how I feel and in the book I say and I'm very open I'm not being self-deprecating I'm always like I'm terrible at most things but I'm I'm good at a couple things and I'm really good at those couple things and one of them is listening this way my deafness and creating space and holding space and so like yeah there's often times where I'm like fuck I can't do this and this and this but what I can do is this and what I can do and I've always been really great at is connecting I mean like how am I not a movie producer or somehow making money from it but like I knew I go okay I don't I don't um I'm not a nurse I can't you know do that I can't but this is what I can do I can I can use my platform for something and there's always I think it's really important to remember that there's always something we can do even if it's um like you well now we can't hug but hugging that fireman um, there's always a way, like, so those of you watching who can't donate or you've donated, there's always something you can do. Never underestimate the power that you have to change someone's life or help someone or make a difference ever. I mean, even just checking in on your friend on FaceTime, you know, yes. having these connections, like the, I, my friends who randomly reach out and check in on me, it's like, oh, you just rearranged all my DNA, like you molecules today. Like, oh, you re you reached for me, and that was such a gift. And it just Same. I mean, it's really, yeah. I really hope people watching take away this message. I know there's a lot of messages. There's been so many messages asking if you'll if you'll consider writing a book. And someone was like, let's start a petition to get Sarah to write a book. So, <laughs> um, there there I have very few things I can do well, and I'm pretty sure that's 
not one of the ones. <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, you're, you're, you, who knows? Because I wonder about that because you're a really beautiful storyteller and communicator. So I don't know. That might be a bullshit story, but who knows? Inner asshole. Inner asshole. You know, I just, um, I don't know. I think you're, a, I, I had no idea how amazing you were going to be. I should have, I mean, the minute I woke up and got that tech from OB, I knew. I was like, oh my God, this is the best. But you are, you're the real deal, man, woman. You're just really spectacular. And I am so grateful to Tommy. He told me to call him Tommy. Tommy, um, for introducing us. He's talking about somebody who connects things. He is, he's magical. I know, I know. Being like you in that way. I was like, can you guys adopt me? And I saw, so you guys, um, he's doing something now. He's part of this this theater group where you can buy t donations, tickets for $10. You have to go to his Instagram. I reposted it, but I don't want to get so it wrong. Can, so you can, you can buy the tickets and, um, and see the plays. They've partnered these fantastic Broadway theater actors with amazing playwrights. They've p partnered and I bought my tickets. I think you can, you can, see until Sunday or Monday the first installment of it and the, all the money goes to No Kid hun Hungry. Okay, so I need oh. to do that. I was like trying to buy the ticket the other day and I got distracted. I'm going to do that. Um, yeah, and, and Tommy's wife is an incredible actress, Amanda. There's just all these amazing actors part of it. Well, yes, and just, I mean, that's the other thing to, that's great about social media right now because we can see these magical things that people are doing. I've said on other uh, Instagram lives that I've um, been able to have about my friends uh, who started Nine Dine One One. What is, which it? is another What's it called? Dine Dine Dine. D, I thought you like, said dying, and I was like, I don't. Okay. No, Dine. So Dine One One, which um, basically, super long story short, uh, my friend is an ER doctor, and one of her girlfriends reached out to her and said, "What can I do to help?" This is very early on, like the first week, and she said. You know, my staff, somebody delivered juices, fresh juices for my staff today. And that was a real morale booster because nobody can step away to get food. And so that friend immediately just reached out with um, the doctor's husband, Chris, my friend Chris, to all their friends and said, here, Venmo, and we'll, we'll contact uh, restaurants. We'll support local restaurants and we'll get the food. I love food. that. I love so, that. And then they partnered with a not-for-profit, like one or two weeks later, now they're saving 200 oh, restaurant oh God, jobs a week it. and feeding. I love that. that so um, I love stories like that and people who, who are just doing good. You know, I go to my last post and we hang up. I, my friend has a company called Conscious Inc. And they're temporary tattoos. And... Um, so I just did a post. I've been meaning to post it and I forgot. They're doing, um, they're sending out free tattoos to all, to so far 40,000 frontline workers, first responders, um, morale boosters. Like I see you. Yeah, I did a post of all these doctors and nurses yeah. holding up the tattoos. And so I guess people are donating and then they're able to send the free stuff, you know, and it's not food, but it's definitely a morale booster. That's the food. That's a form of food. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. So everyone can go check that. I've been sharing, 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 I've been sharing really um, inspirational things lately that my friends and, and people that I know are up to. Um, my friend, I gave her a scholarship for, she lost a child for France this month. It's been canceled, but she was in Georgia and she went and left her family for 12 weeks and she volunteered to be a nurse um, in the front lines. She's in Newark. So I've been sharing about her and like her Venmo. She, she like couldn't even afford to get housing. And you know, everyone's like, they're giving free hotels, but not for everyone. There's very specific, um, you know, requirements. Um, anyway, so like just sharing about a lot of really cool, um, it, it, tomorrow or later I'll be sharing something that every mother counts. Christy Turlington is a dear friend of mine, has a program, just r people who are really using their businesses or platforms or voices to create good right now. Yeah, that's amazing. We are going to run out of time. I just think okay. the world of you, I'm, I'm so, so grateful. And I think you're just a remarkable, beautiful person. And um, I yeah, I, the same with you.
Thank you for this. Thank you Thank for you. that. Thank you. Thank um, you. The paperback comes out June 16th, so I'm going to order, um, not order, organize a virtual um, book tour. And so I'm going to get some people to be in conversation with me. So I'm going to ask you to do that. It'll probably be like 30 minutes or whatever, but just, you know, the paperback will be a different cover. It's really beautiful. It has Liz Gilbert's quote on it. And um, Yeah, and I want to do that because I want to talk to you about the skillet. Oh yeah, in the backpack. Yeah, we're so so. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to come on my book on my book tour. But meanwhile, I'll just share the word. And if you could think of anyone else that wants to hop on my talk show to help raise money, send me a text. And I'm gonna text you an OB right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you so oh, my much. Love. Such Thank a pleasure. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.